Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 85, we're going to take a look at some of my favorite tubes of all time. The Slovenia Bad Boy and the Tungsol Mouse Ear. And we'll go into details in just a minute. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now, if you follow Tube Lab, you know I have favorite tubes, and the 6SN7 is certainly among them. So today, we're going to have a look at some of the best sounding 6SN7s ever made. Well, the 12 volt filament version, the 12SN7, Slovenia, Bad Boy, and the Tungsol Mouse Ears, Tall Boy. These tubes are why I designed the Universal Kit 6 or 12 SN7 preamp. Having a preamp that can play any 6 or 12 SN7 tube ever made is huge, especially today, with quickly diminishing supplies of quality vintage tubes. Especially the 6 SN7s. There are high demand tubes, at least the better ones. Okay, let's have a quick look at them. Anytime you see a brown box like this, think mil spec, and these are certainly those. So we've got a date packed of January 9th, 1952, and a company name, Sperry Gyroscope Company. Now, Sperry was a U.S. military manufacturer, and they specialized in high-altitude, high-definition aerial photography, and I believe also in uh, aviation navigation equipment. So they needed the very best tubes that were available. Let's take a quick look at the tube. Now I've shown Sylvania Bad Boys many, many times. Here's your label. Jan, Joint Army Navy. CHS, I believe, is just the U.S. Pentagon or military designator for Slovenia as a manufacturer. 12 SN7 GT. So this is the first version. And they have a lower spec than the later GTAs and GTBs. We've got, on my label, I always mark in red 12 volt tubes so we don't accidentally mix them up with the 6SN7 version. And we've got a large waste chrome, which means we've got a bottom foil getter in this case. It's tough to see, it's way down there. And we've got an elevated black T-plate, pair of them, of course, because this is a twin triode, so two tubes inside one envelope. We've got three rivets. There's two versions of this tube that are common. There's the two-rivet version and the three-rivet version. Now, what's the difference between a 12SN7 and a 6SN7? It's just the filament voltage required to lamp it. That's it. And of course, because the filament slides up and into the middle of the structure, it's easy at the manufacturing point to make 6SN7s or 12SN7s. All you have to do is change the filament. Everything else, I believe, is absolutely identical. Now, do the 6SN7s and 12SN7s sound exactly the same? No, there's a bit small, very small difference. And I would give the edge, actually, to the 12-volt versions. Okay. And someday maybe we'll talk more about that. Over here we've got same kind of box, date pack November 1952, also a Sperry tube. Now I found about a couple of dozen each of these tubes from the early 1950s, which is an extremely unusual find. It was expensive. <laughs> I emptied the bank account, but whenever I see early tubes, even um, tubes that take the 12 volt filament, I grab them because I know that I've got customers who are going to want them. In fact, I had somebody who wanted them before I even made it public. So these have a very similar label, a Jan label, but in the case of Tungsol, they have a CTL designator and they're also the 12 SN7 GTs. They're elevated plates, but they don't have any chrome anywhere. So what's going on with that? Well, if we look way down at the bottom here, you'll see a large D-shaped bar getter. 
And that bar, the solid bar that runs across, that's the material that helps maintain a perfect vacuum or a close to a perfect vacuum. So it's not actually flashed off. So there is no chrome. The material that does the absorption sits in that bar. It's hard to see, I know. But someday you'll have a tube like this in your hand and you can marvel at that technology. It's not common, but it's not unusual either to see it done that way. So we've got an elevated pair of gray T-plates with two rivets. And we've got, of course, a clear dome, but we've got these wonderful big round mica spacers, so-called mouse ears, not hard to see why. <laughs> What are, what are those doing? Well, they're helping hold the tube uh, under all operating conditions, so cold, hot, vibration, altitude, you name it. They're helping hold the plate structures snugly in place so that we don't have any vibration and our, electricals, um, our tube electrically can continue to function under probably severe conditions. I, don't, I have to pull out the data sheet and see if they even talk about the G-force, etc., etc., um, but we do know that that's what this, what these micas were for. And best of all, when it comes to home audio, we don't have G's, we don't have extreme temperatures, I hope, but what we do get is an extremely quiet tube. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. So how did they sound? Well, I did a mini review. Let's start off with the Sylvanias. So all these tubes um, all date from the early 1950s, 51, 52, 53, with the most common date, 1952. So what was going on in the early 1950s that would have the U.S. military stocking up on large quantities of mil-spec tubes, or in this case, uh, buying equipment from a military supplier in probably large quantities? Well, the Korean War was underway. Started in 1951, ended in 1953, so 52 was probably the biggest year for buying equipment. So it's not surprising that a lot of the mil-spec tubes, the high-quality mil-spec tubes that I find from the early 1950s, were all dating around 1952. Okay, so I use a set of standard test tracks, and then I fill in uh, tracks depending on how I'm feeling. And, oh yeah, the equipment I use is important. So I, of course, use the Universal Preamp, uh, but I also was running the Yuri Monoblock. So pure Class A from beginning to end. Sh short signal pass it really helps with um, clarity of sound, musicality, you name it. Anyways, you'll see in the review. So one of the things I did do is I added in one of my favorite early tracks, Duke Ellington's Blues in Orbit, this was recorded in 1959. Now these tubes all date from the early 50s, but that's still fairly close. And wow, this sounded absolutely, it sounded the best I've ever heard it with both of these tubes. Um, and it's not surprising, you know, the, a 1959 recording would have had two microphones, it would have had a tube mixer, it would have been um, just a few tracks probably of recording. The, even the lathe that cut the original uh, record would have been tube run, believe it or not. So uh, it's not surprising that tubes from the same era as the recording sound really good, really suited to it. So bass was very good, mid-range is very good. The three C's, clean, clear, and crisp. And I marked here, the music just pops. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Treble was very good, the three C's. Noise and microphonics were low, not surprising in a brand new tube, a mil-spec tube. And in conclusion, I said, all around, excellent tube, music just pops out of a dark black background. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when you have an instrument come in, or a vocal, or any sound in a recording, if it comes out of the music as its own entity, with no noise around it, no fuzziness, that's what I mean when I say it just comes right out of a dark black background, like it came from space, from nothing, from a vacuum. <laughs> um, sorry about that. And, and the music just pops, well, 
that's part of what we're hearing. Um, it's hard to put in words. You'd have to really hear a tube that just the music just pops off of it. But basically, I think in its simplest terms, we're talking about excellent dynamics. Uh, so the the response of the tube in the system is really quick, and as a result, when we have a little bit of an increase in volume, a singer comes into a song with a bit of oomph, that really just, it pops. It pops right onto uh, our soundscape, and it's, it's delightful, frankly. It means that we're, what we're listening to is very much alive, and it sounds like that, it feels like that. Okay, what about the tongues? Well, same equipment for the tongues, same basic tracks, though I added in uh, a track from Nora Jones just for fun to listen to it. One of my favorite tracks. And, and the reason why I put the Nora Jones track in is because the tongue solos, I was trying to hear the bass in more detail. So I added an extra track just to listen to a bass, some really good electric bass that's on after the fall on this re live recording, this live version of it. And it was there and it sounded great. So that's what I was looking for. So bass was very good, clean, good tone. Now, when I mark clean for bass, a lot of bass can be muddy. And if you've never heard clean bass, you need to find it because it makes a huge difference. Muddy bass is, is well, it's pretty awful. So, and bass is really tough to reproduce. Tubes have a hard time, even solid state gear has a hard time with bass. Those long, low, waves are really tough to reproduce and your room has tough has a tough time with bass notes as well so um, mid-range very good three C's treble very good the three C's as you're seeing both these tubes are excellent tubes noise and microphonics was low very quiet underlined not surprising for the tongues in conclusion, I wrote detail, 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 exclamation mark, soundstage, exclamation mark. So anytime you've got a very low noise tube and a good quality tube, you're going to hear detail that you'll never hear with any other, other tube. And with good detail, you often get good soundstage. Now, you need a good system for that. It needs to be well set up, but it's not hard. Okay. So... What's the difference? Well, they're both some of the best sounding tubes ever made, in my opinion. And I adore them both. I would say that Sylvania Bad Boys are a little bit warmer sounding, and that the Tongue Sols are a little bit more neutral sounding, with a little bit better detail than the Sylvanias. I could listen to either tube all day long, every day, for the rest of my life. They're that good. Okay. And now for the reviews. Let's put those aside carefully. I want to show you something before I forget. This is a standard test lead that comes with a, a good quality volt ohm meter. Have a look at what happened here. Uh-huh. Now, I do a lot of high voltage testing. And my hands are not, you're not down here when you're holding a probe, right? You're way up here. So, that's a really bad thing. So, it's always wise to spend money on high quality test leads. These aren't. They're not junk either, but they're not high quality. Um, and silicon test leads are the best by a good manufacturer. And it's always wise to take a look at your equipment on a regular basis as you're using it. I almost got caught by this, but I didn't. I was actually holding it and probing high voltage. And I looked down and I thought, huh, that's not good. <laughs> I backed up in a hurry. Okay, those are garbage. Okay, what's going on at Melatone Kits? Well, we're busy working on prototypes. Both Charles and I have got our own prototypes that we're playing with. And Charles is close to making our first production run of aluminum top plates, which will mean sometime Hopefully in the next month or two, we're going to have kit amps in the store, the first production kit amps, which will be great. We've got the parts basically in stock now. It's the top plates that need to be made, and they take a lot of time, which is why we invested in a CNC machine in the first place. Okay, 
And another Universal Preamp Test Builder just finished. Let's have a quick look at what he had to say. You know I love comments. Let's zoom in a little bit. I love comments from test builders. It really is just, it really helps to sell the kits. So it's that he says, hello Jim, it is finished. It sounds incredible. That's his exclamation marks. This was a great kit for a first timer because I was late to the test build. He was one of the last to finish. I think he's the last to finish. I benefited from all the updated tips. So as test builders build, we, um, we update all of the rest of the test builders as well as we update the kits for the production version. I had one issue while I was testing. I had no output from the transformer. I had all my power in, but none out. I started from the very start of the power chain and discovered I had somehow broken the neutral jumper wire. So troubleshooting skills like that, I can show you, and I do in the video, how to go about um, testing uh, for voltages and layout and looking for problems and how to go about troubleshooting. But clearly a lot of this is up to how you approach things. And he started at the beginning of the chain and worked forward. Very smart. With the little extra wire that was left over and the extra spade terminals, I was able to make a new wire and all is well. We always put extra stuff in the kits. We try to make sure there's surplus. And in this case, he was able to fix it with what was left over. So that's just great. I listened for hours last night. I had to sit there and let track after track play. Every song was more enjoyable and I even ended up turning up the music a little louder, th louder than I usually do due to the quality of the sound. Now that's common I find with high quality gear is that you just want to hear it all. Okay, let's keep going here. Right now the preamplifier is driving a little 5 watt class A amp that Nelson Pass gave me right from the workbench, right from his workbench. Neat! <laughs> In case you don't know, Nelson Pass is the guru of uh, solid state class A. Absolutely, he's the man. I've used, I used to have an Ocelia preamp and passive digital tube active for phono, that's pretty common. And some 300 B mono blocks, excellent. The system now sounds the best I have had it in all my years of playing, and I've had everything from Atmosphere, Macintosh, Rogue, Bryston, Quad. Wow, okay, that's, that's a who's who of great manufacturers. So that, that's huge. That's big that uh, he's comparing my little preamp with uh, uh, the big boys. Like you say, the tubes are the amplifier. I repeat that. I'll keep repeating that until you guys start shouting it back at me. There's something special about having built something yourself that makes everything all the more sweeter. But without your great kit and videos, I would probably not have tried to build my own preamplifier. Well, thank you. That is why, that is our approach, is we're really not designing kits for people who can design and build their own equipment. We're designing kits to help you get started in this wonderful hobby. And our approach is that we show you how to do everything, and um, but we don't show you absolutely everything. You need to learn a little bit as you build. Uh, some people have a lot to learn, and we'll have a few problems at the end to fix up. Other people, like this test builder, he really raced sort the uh, my English is never very good, even though it's my first language. He did an excellent job of completing his kit. He had a small problem, and he found it fairly quickly using um, good, good procedures for troubleshooting. And that's really quite common. When I first started building prototypes, I almost never built a prototype that worked out of the box, as off the bench, let's say. But I, as I got better and better at designing equipment, more and more of my equipment worked perfectly as it came off the bench. But, you know, it's, there's still, I'm starting to work with a new tube right now for, um, for a prototype. And it's been on the bench, in the system, back on the bench, and it's been a bit of, bit of a struggle. Um, 
So it happens to the best of us. I'll leave a review for you shortly. I hope so. We love reviews in the store. Thank you again for the gift of sound and reward of building something myself. There's nothing like building something for yourself, especially if you're really into audio and everybody who listens to this channel is. Um, building your own equipment. It's, and the interesting thing is, I know this is hard to believe, but if you take your time and you build a good quality kit, there's every chance that it will be better sounding than almost anything you can buy off the shelf from a manufacturer. And the reason for that is that you can put in the detail to the build that they can't. You can put in the specifics that you want. We try to do all of that for you in the design work. We have a very specific goal, and that is we want the best sound possible at a reasonable price. And we to do that, one of our core philosophies is simplicity. You will never find a lot of gadgets on our amplifiers. You'll never find remote controls. Anything that distracts from the sound, even if it's a convenience or a feature that might sell the kits, is not of interest to us because it, it will detract from the sound. Okay, enough of that blah, blah, blah. Let's take a look at what came in this week. Let's get everybody all arranged here. Let's start with, um, this is the regular tongue cell. Now, about a couple of dozen each of the um, mouse ears and the bad boys came in, but also some tongue cell, regular tongue cells from 1953, so a year and a bit later. And um, they don't have the mouse ears, but there's the same basic tube. And because they have, mm, they're a little bit more common, let's say, the um, public would be buying this tube, not the mouse ear version. Um, and in fact, actually, this is a mil-spec version. So it is a, it is a military tube, but this is what the uh, everyday tube looks like as well. And it probably went into equipment that was less demanding. Uh, let's see if the box gives us a hint as to who ordered this. No, it doesn't tell us anything. So we don't know. All we know is it, it's the Joint Army Navy tube. So it was designed, it was designated uh, for military use. And these sound almost as good as the mouse ears and are a lot less expensive. So um, if you're on a budget, this is this is a great tube to buy. A whole bunch of EL84s came in. Uh, all Sylvanias, true Sylvanias. This is the gray plate version. And this is the black plate version. And they're not in the store yet, but they will be hopefully on the weekend. And some more RFTs came in. These are rebranded Amperex, believe it or not. And they're labeled Made in Great Britain. So as if you've watched me talk about RFTs over and over again, this is one of my favorite EL34s. And they anchor the uh, R8 set that's called German Gold. These were not made in Great Britain. They were made in the uh, former East Germany. And they're just wonderful tubes. We were just talking about how the tongue cells um, have such great detail. For, for a power tube, for an EO34 in particular, which has a lot of second harmonics, so distortion, good distortion, but it's still distortion, these present the sound in an extremely clear manner. Probably the clearest, nicest sounding EO34 ever made. The comparative to um, the uh, Svetlana, which is a very similar tube quality-wise and sound-wise, is the Svetlana. It's a little bit warmer. So it's sort of like the Sylvania and the Tungsol 6SN or 12SN7s that we were just talking about. Sort of a similar comparison. And of course, the best EL34 ever made at all time, in my opinion, is the Mullard XF2. And it sort of combines the best of both. It has lovely warmth and good detail. Anyways, the RFTs, of course, are a lot more affordable than um, than the mullets. Okay, well, if you stay till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world, 
And if your order is $150 or more after shipping, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.